And I'm going to tell you about uh, this work on independence of normal numbers, which is joined uh, with Olivier Carton uh, from University of Paris Diderot and uh, partly with Pablo Ariel Haiber from University of Buenos Aires. All right. Um, 100 years ago, Emile Borel gave a definition of the most elementary form of randomness for real numbers. And he gave it thinking in the sequence of digits that determine the expansion of these numbers. And he called them normal numbers. Let's be precise with the definition. Uh, many of you already know it, but I will start from the very beginning. And for us, during my talk, a base is going to be an integer greater than or um, equal to two. And we will um, say that the real number in the unit x, in the unit interval, has an expansion in, a given, in that base. Uh, and that expansion is going to be a sequence of digits, a1, a2, a3. Uh, that these digits are between 0 and b minus 1. That is 0, 1, 2, up to b minus 1 such that x is written as zero dot and all these uh, numbers where that they correspond to uh, the series, uh, the, they are the coefficients of the negative powers of the base uh, corresponding to expansion. And for rational numbers, we are going to keep the expansion that ends with zeros as opposed to the expansion that ends with all the b minus ones. And Borel defined uh, the notion of normality um, first by saying, well, a number is going to be simply normal in a given base when, in its expansion, every single digit appears with the same um, frequency as any other digit. So if we are in base B, every digit appears with a limiting frequency, 1 over B. A real number is now normal to base B if Every, for every possible block length k, uh, each block of length k occurs with the same limiting probability, same limiting frequency. So uh, that limiting frequency is going to be 1 over b to the k, so b to the length of the block. And by how do we count these occurrences of a, a given block? We count it at any position of the expansion. There is another way uh, to define normality, which turns out to be equivalent, which is instead of counting at any position for it, any given block, we only count at the positions that are multiple of the block length. That will mean that a number is normal if it is simply normal to all the powers of the given base. And this definition is going to be the one we, that we will use today, the notion of normality by counting at the positions multiple of the block length it will be more convenient for us. And uh, last, a real number is absolutely normal if it is normal to every positive base. All right. The existence of normal numbers uh, came immediately after the definition, uh, and it was proved by Borel himself. Uh, he showed that almost all numbers in the unit inter interval are uh, norm are um, normal to every base. Let's give first counterexamples. That number that I put some spaces only to parse the expansion more easily, it, it's not simply normal to base 10 because it has far too many zeros. This other number, it has the same uh, number of occurrences of each digit, 0, 1, 2, up to 9. However, it's not normal to base uh, 10 because it's not, for instance, simply normal to base 100. The block of 1, 1 does not even appear. 
The numbers in the middle third Cantor set are not simply normal to base three, because if you write them down in base three, it, they will lack the digit one in their expansion. Rational numbers are not normal to any possible base, because they end with a tail of zero. So. Uh, and this requires a proof, but the Liouville's constant is not normal to any base. Good for counterexamples. What happens with examples? So Borel knew the existence, and he asked, give, please give me an example. Um, and when, what did he mean by an example? He meant that, well, he wanted to know whether the usual mathematical constants such as e pi or square root of two are absolutely normal, or at least normal to some base. This is still open, and it is one of the most famous questions of normal numbers. And very uh, late in his life, uh, he conjectured that, in fact, all irrational algebraic numbers are uh, normal to every base. And to answer one of the questions during yesterday, uh, actually Borel uh, was 80 years old when he made this conjecture. So the examples, I'm gonna go very fast, but some people asked yesterday, so I decided to include um, some, a little bit of the history. Uh, on the examples of normal numbers, and the first examples were given by Lebec and Sharpinsky independently, and they appeared in the Bulletin of the Société Mathématique de France, and they are constructions that are not computable. In fact, in the two cases, they are the infimum of, a, an, infimum of an infinite union uh, of some sets that are defined in the paper. The first example of a computable number was given by Alan Turing, uh, that's a handwritten part on, on the top uh, of the slide. And this is the typewritten, but it did not appear um, published at the time of Turing. Presumably it was written in 1937, uh, immediately after he wrote on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem. And I suspect, oops, Here. I suspect the reason he did not publish is this correspondence with G. H. Hardy, uh, where he says, I'm sorry, Turing, that I have not responded to your letter when, where you asked uh, what's the importance of this work. And uh, I'm sorry to say that I think Lebec already did what you are trying to do. And he completely missed that Turing's construction was indeed effective, uh, computable. He, that was something finitely based, and he did not realize of uh, that contribution in, the, in Turing's paper. And I would like to point here that there's a word, champernon, here, that I will come back in a few slides to that word, champernon, that is mentioned by G. H. Hardy. <coughs> and the reason Hardy answers to the, well, has correspondence with Turing, because he was a teacher in, in King's College, Cambridge, uh, um, uh, yes, th that's why they met there before. Uh, okay, the, uh, very short, the story on examples uh, of numbers that are normal to all bases or normal to some bases and constructions that ensure that not normality to some other bases. So there's... Uh, it is known how to do both things at the same time. So as I said, first, uh, Lebec and Sharpinsky, not computable constructions, then Turing, a computable <laughs> construction. Then uh, a great work has been done by Wolfgang Schmidt uh, with this construction being normal to a, an arbitrary set of bases and not normal to the complement, uh, to the bases in the complement. Uh, then a construction for a number that has the, lo the fastest uh, known velocity, speed of convergence to normality. Normality is a limiting probability uh, condition, so it is a limit involved, and if you want that limit to go rapidly to, um, to what is expected, uh, then you have this is known as discrepancy. So this is the construction no for the lowest known discrepancy. Uh, then I'm skipping some of the story, which is 
several constructions with the same properties. In the years 2000, the notion of computability is associated to um, uh, normal numbers and their complexity. And first, uh, exponential constructions. And in 2013, three people, um, actually one of them is here, <laughs> two of them are here, <laughs> one, um, one uh, well, group was Mayer, Dom, and Lutz. They did it with martingales, a polynomial time uh, algorithm that computes an absolutely normal number. And another group did it, uh, uh, Andre Nis and Santiago Figueira, and another group, we did it with Pablo Haber and Ted Sleiman, and we actually got it, a very fast, uh, efficient algorithm which it computes the nth digit of an absolutely normal number in nearly quadratic time, n squared times log star n, or log n. Uh, then we learned how to make constructions ensuring normality to some basis and not simple normality to some other basis that was not known before. Uh, and we managed simple normality uh, in arbitrary ways we wanted. That's with uh, work with Yann Bougeot. And in 2015, we were able to combine, uh, for the first time in the in a construction that was not known before, how to combine normality with some other mathematical property. And in this case, we what we did is uh, we computed an absolutely normal number that is Liouville. That means it has an infinite uh, irrationality exponent. Uh, unfortunately, the computational complexity of that algorithm is exponential. Uh, and this year, uh, we have been working on combining com computational complexity and discrepancy conditions. And some uh, people like Tichi Shear and Madrid are also working on that. Um, all right. So uh, I said that uh, the algorithm we compute, we obtain is very efficient and we can actually run it and if someone is interested can download the program from my website and this is the, the number expressed in base 10. This is the way it starts. Some people ask me, well, what's the interest of computing a normal number if the property of normality is just a limit? Uh, what's the point in exhibiting the first digits? Um, it makes no sense. No, I, ask, I answer that Indeed, it is interesting because we have a calculation of what is the discrepancy at each, a discrepancy for normality for each given block at each initial segment position. So we know at that position how fast it is converging to normality. So we have some information on the initial segment. Um, well, for normality to a given base, that means if you make a construction where the only thing you ensure is that your number is normal to some given base, then the work has been much more productive. And the first example was given by Champernon in uh, 1933, and he worked in King's College, Cambridge, under the direction of G.H. Hardy. That's why in the letter, the name of Hardy appeared. And he, what he did is he concatenated all positive integers in the natural order and he obtained, uh, he put a zero dot in front of it and he said, okay, this is a number that is normal to base 10. The actual proof is by <coughs> direct counting. And there have been plenty of uh, very nice generalizations, 1935, Besikovic, instead of concatenating the positive integers, concatenated all the squares in the natural order. Then you can do with many other sequences, for instance, with the primes, and that's work by Coppola and Erdos, 1945, uh, 46. And then a different construction is done by um, De Bruyne words, and that deserves a talk by itself, and I'm very, keen on that uh, construction for extensions of, or it's actually infinite De Bruyne words. It's a, there's a way to, given a De Bruyne word in a, an alphabet that is greater than two, you can extend it to a larger De Bruyne word and larger and larger. And I can discuss this with anyone who is interested after the talk. Um, and a different sort of uh, 
examples comes from the work of Bailey and Borwein and these Stoneham numbers that they are called. These are series defined as we have here, so they have a very nice formulation, which they have been proved to be normal to base two, but not simply normal to base six. And it is quite curious the way they did it because they inspect, they are in Canada, they have a laboratory where they inspect the expansions initial segment of the expansions of real numbers, and if they find that they are strange in some way, as it happened with this number, it has a very big lacoon of zeros, and then says, ah, oh, we will study this. They knew that these numbers were normal to base two by the definition, but they did not know they were going to be not normal to base six. And actually, once they found that, and they computed very large initial segments. Then the proof, mathematical proof, uh, follows because uh, of the way, the shape of that series, it happens that it produces long, um, well, lo long rows of zeros. Um, but it's experimental work. It's very curious. But how they know that it's normal to base two? It, that's a Stoneham result. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, that's a class of, yeah, it was, yeah, for all the powers of two, it was known. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, what it was not known is the non-simple normality to base six. Uh, uh, and in this work today, I'm gonna concentrate only on normality in a given base. So instead of looking at numbers, as I'm interested <coughs> in, in general, I will look at today at words. That means only the string or the infinite word that corresponds to the expansion of a real number in a given base. And for that, uh, it suffices that uh, we consider the notion of normality that, or the characterization of normality that comes from um, uh, the uh, definition of normality or the characterization that comes from using finite automata. We know that in computability theory or randomness, we define a random uh, sequence or a random number as a number that for which its initial segments are incompressible by a Turing machine. Now, for normal numbers, there is an analog result that says that a, a, an infinite word is normal if its initial segments are infinitely many times, are not compressible by a finite automaton. And this result is actually, I will give it in the next slide, uh, due to several people put together in two parts. Uh, so first, uh, we need a definition. So the kind of finite automata uh, we are using is a finite transducer, uh, which is a finite set of states with an initial state, an input, uh, so it has two tapes. Each tape can have an alphabet, so alphabet A for input, alphabet B for output, and the transition function determines um, uh, for each state and each symbol read in the input tape, which is the state you go on the output tape. And uh, this is an example of a finite transducer. So you start in Q0, and if the input uh, happens to be 0, 1, double 0, then etc. You first read a 0, you keep it, then you read a 1, you keep it, then you read another 1, Oops. Uh, you, you read uh, one, you keep it, then when you need another one, you skip it. This is, we write uh, epsilon for the empty word, so we do not write it down on the output tape. And then uh, when we find an, a zero, we do uh, write another zero. What does this uh, transducer do? Just delete set. Yeah. One's up. The, what it does is, if you have a blocks of ones, you uh, only keep a, one, a single one in each block of ones. Very good. Uh, and uh, we define a compression ratio for a transducer. Uh, and this, uh, if we write uh, a run uh, of a transducer starting from the initial uh, state and 
uh, for an input X uh, that is, consists of a sequence of symbols A1, A2, etc. And we say a run in, in that given transducer will be a sequence of transitions that, as I said, you start from Q0, you read A1, and you output. When you output, you are allowed to output a string, uh, a word, not necessarily just one symbol. You go to the next state and so on. And then the compression ratio of this infinite input in the transducer T is defined as the lim inf of the size of the output at each state divided by the number um, of uh, states you have visited. So it is the length of the string that you have output <coughs> up to the state, the nth state you visited, divided by the number of states you visited. Notice that the V1s are, V2s, V3 are strings, are words. And then you normalize by the alphabet sizes. So for example, we can just make them all empty and get a big compression. Yes, <laughs> that, but no, but that is the definition, we're very general, but you're interested only in one-to-one -one transducers. So you want to think of them as compressors, and this is the definition due to Hoffman. Uh, they call it, he, he calls them useless <laughs> compressors, these transducers, because you can go back from the output back to the input, um, because they are one-to-one. -one. And the compression ratio is then defined for any transducer that it is deterministic and one-to-one, -one. so you take the compression ratio of a given x is the infimum of all the compression ratios for any such transducer. And uh, this definition is actually due to um, the work of Di Latrup uh, Latz Mayordomo uh, that put together this notion of compression with uh, an early theorem by Schnorrenstein you get a characterization of normality in terms of incompressibility by uh, this one-to-one -one deterministic transducers. And they actually went through the, an intermediate concept, which is martingales that are uh, defined in terms of finite automata. So it, this gives the characterization of normality in terms of finite automata, which, by the way, it is wrongly said in Wikipedia. It's not uh, right what it appears there. And, oops, uh, if you want to read the direct proof, you can have it uh, without going through martingales. Uh, plus, it is possible to consider, instead of deterministic finite uh, transducers, to consider them non-deterministic, you get the same result. Also, you can add a counter and you get exactly the same characterization. And Carton and Haber also <coughs> proved that instead of considering just transducers that go one way, as usual, as we imagine, going through the input tape uh, in one direction, uh, you can go in both directions and you get, again, the same characterization. So it's quite robust. Uh, that you can do a lot of things to your transducer and still uh, get exactly the same notion of incompressibility, uh, giving uh, the normal words. However, uh, we do not know whether uh, if you add a stack to your finite automaton and you get a one-to-one -one, uh, deterministic push-down automaton, um, then we do not know whether you get exactly the same notion of incompressibility. Uh, it's open. However, if you put it, push down automaton, one-to-one, -one, but being non-deterministic, we know you can compress some normal words. And the counterexample is easy. Um, it's based on Champernon's number, um, a, a little construction on that. Now we arrive to the notion of independence that apparently uh, no one has uh, bothered to consider it. And the work uh, I'm going to describe now, it, is, it mimics uh, the notion of independence we know for, a normal, uh, for real random numbers. Um, 
and we will need uh, some kind of transducers that uh, uh, are similar to the ones we just uh, defined, but we are going to use uh, two input tapes and one output tape. And the content of the first input tape is going to be the actual input, but the content of the second input tape is going to be considered as an oracle. And a transducer T is going for us to be one-to-one -one if for each fixed oracle uh, sequence, the function going from the input to the uh, output of the transducer, considering both X and Y, is one-to-one. -one. And this is very important uh, that the, this notion of one-to-one -one is as said here. And formally, uh, we will have um, the, this definition of a transducer with two input tapes, this kind of finite automata, and we will consider that uh, uh, we go from one state to the next by looking at the two symbols in the input and oracle <coughs> tape. Uh, and we will register the moves we do in both tapes. For each tape, we either move zero or one position to the left, to forward. And we will be able to write down an, a word in the output tape, not necessarily a symbol, a, a full word. And we will um, write this, use this notation from going from a state and a position in the input tape, a position in the oracle tape, uh, reading these symbols in the input and oracle tape, and this is going to uh, correspond to the uh, word written in the output tape, and we arrive to a position, a state, uh, after, and leave the head in position <coughs> N in the input tape and position N prime in the oracle tape with uh, the conditions that, well, we moved D or D prime and D prime respectively. And now we need a notion of compression ratio for uh, these automata and that now they have the oracle tape and how do we define? Uh, and again, we uh, write a run uh, in a given compressor for an input X and an oracle X prime, and we register the uh, configurations. <coughs> we go from state and positions in the tapes, and with uh, well, the movement of or the, the run of the transducer being registered as that. Ooh. And we arrive to the definition that says, if you have a, a transducer T, the um, conditional compression ratio of X given X prime as an oracle is going to be the limit again of the length of the output at, uh, after uh, visiting N states divided by the position uh, number you are at after visiting N states. Uh, uh, for simplicity, I consider just input and output here being in the same alphabet, so that's why the logarithmic factor does not appear there, just to have lighter slides. And the important part is that this compression ratio, conditional compression ratio, does not depend on the position you have in the oracle tape. So I don't care how much I use the oracle, but uh, I get the compression that only takes care of uh, how many symbols I read from the actual input tape. Uh, some other possibilities exist, and this is the one we thought it works better for uh, the notion we have in mind. So we use the oracle as much as we want. And again, we, uh, the Compression ratio independently of uh, the compressor you used, well, you have to take the infimum of all the possible deterministic one-to-one -one, uh, trans, uh, transducers. Um, and recall this notion of one-to-one -one is as I explained before. Any question on this? 
And now we come to the definition of independence. And the definition of independence says two sequences are independent if one does not help uh, the other to compress better. So formally, uh, we ask that uh, two sequences, uh, two words, X and Y, are independent if the compression ratio of the first um, equals the, compression, the conditional compression <coughs> ratio of the first given the second, and they have to be both greater than zero. If you consider compression ratio zero, then the notion trivializes. So to be independent, you have to have a, a positive compression ratio. Being positive means incompressible. So a, a word is incompressible if its compression ratio is co completely incompressible. Its compression ratio is one, means that you were not able to compress, uh, uh, to compress infinitely many times. Uh, a compression ratio zero means that you have compressed a lot. Um, and the first result uh, says that if you take the pairs of uh, infinite words, you find out that uh, almost all pairs of infinite words are independent. So that set of pairs of independent words has Lebesgue measure one. And to prove that, what we, mm, the, the important part of that proof requires this lemma that it consists of uh, looking at the conditional compression ratio on normal, conditional normal oracles. So you consider all the y's that are normal, and for each normal y, the set uh, of uh, words that have compression ratio less than one has Lebesgue measure zero. But is it true that if we take just two independent Martin Luther random sequences, they are independent? Yes. In your sense? Yes. Yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, being uh, random implies being normal, and yes. So this implies this theory. Uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yes. Something we did not say in the paper, but we can. You say that for every x, if we take a section of the set, fix some x, we have Lebesgue measure one. But that's what Peter says. But I think that's true. Uh, it's true, it's true. I don't think I follow. If you fix, uh, you fix a normal y, you say. No. So you fix one uh, that is normal, and then you you ask which of. Uh, the set of those x which are compression ratio one has measure one. one. Yes. So yes, it is true. Y is, y is oracle, yeah? And we compress X. Okay. Yes, yes. But and he says, if you're, if you're able, very few X's are compressible. In the, very few X's are, so the set of X's that are compressible, it's small. Yeah, yeah, just, just a notation. Y is an oracle and X is what we compress. Yes. Uh, and why, why, we, why we ask Y to be normal? Oh, well, that, that was the way we... we Prove it. That's part of the proof. Uh, in the proof, we use this lemma uh, instead of using the, the, your way of thinking. <laughs> this is, was our way of thinking. It says we did it uh, for the case why being normal and the mm -hmm. case why not being normal. It was part of our proof, uh, and it just happens to be a lemma that it says the fact. Sometimes you think that a normal uh, oracle will help you more than a non-normal oracle, which is. Maybe, maybe true, maybe not, but uh, something to... If they all to... <laughs> <Okay. coughs> um, and, and now I'm going to tell two main theorems on the notion of independence. Uh, and one theorem will say, how do you combine independent words that are normal and you still keep normality? So you, I'm interested in the preservation of the property of normality among independent words. And 
and the other is given a normal word, <coughs> you are interested in selecting some positions and uh, from that normal word and still preserve normality. So one it is, it is a problem of preservation of normality by some operations with automata. Our approach now is completely operational and I will describe some uh, future work that it, it uh, aims to put it in non-operational terms. So uh, for doing uh, these operations, uh, we first define a splitter. A splitter is, a, again, a finite automaton, a, a transducer with one input tape and two output tapes. This is a new uh, transducer in our talk. Uh, so what this transducer does is given an input, it will split into two uh, output tapes. And this splitting is done only by looking at uh, the state you are and the symbol in the input tape. And it either outputs uh, this letter it read, it puts it in the output tape, in the first output tape, and in the second tape it puts nothing, or the other way around. For each state, uh, for a state it reads the letter A, and in the first tape it outputs nothing, but in the second tape copies the uh, symbol it read. And the important uh, concept for these splitters is that for each state, all outgoing transitions have the same type. We, are, we do not allow to do different behavior depending on the letter. So it's like, like from this selection rule, implemented as a finite automaton, yeah? We, we decide whether to, to select, you know, in one sequence or, or other sequences, just what we do not select, depending only on the previous thing, but not on the next letter. Perfect. And if this splitter, we use it as a concept, uh, but we are interested actually in uh, the uh, uh, transducer that uh, is obtained by exchanging input and output. Uh, what happens if uh, we, well, we call it a shuffler, which is going to be, so you exchange, now you have two inputs and uh, you want to combine uh, the inputs and output a single uh, sequence. Uh, by the rever reversing the arrows of this splitter. And then a shuffler is going, uh, we are interested in, is, has to be deterministic with two input uh, inputs and uh, one output, and whether the next digit is taken from the first uh, or the second input word depends only on the current state. Uh, formally, it, it is exactly this, but uh, we don't need to read it because it's what I just said. So you reverse the splitter. I think it's a very uh, intuitive notion. Uh, and then the shuffler is reversing the arrows. Uh, but again, uh, keep in mind that for each state, uh, Q, arriving state, Q, all incoming transitions are of the same type. So uh, this is important. And an example of a shuffler here, uh, we have state initial state Q0, and then from uh, the input, uh, uh, first, uh, if you have a, a letter, zero or one, and you don't read nothing from the second, then you copy the first letter, you arrive to state Q1, and in this state, uh, you ignore the first tape, and from the second tape, you copy whatever is in the second tape. If you have then X and Y like this, what this uh, shuffler does? It's a join, yes. Oops. Yes, yeah. Uh, it is a join. Uh, so this shuffler considers one digit from each sequence and uh, comes to the join, which is a very natural thing to do between uh, two inputs. But a shuffler may actually read a lot uh, instead of being like this. It can read a lot from one tape and very little from the other in one state and in the next state do the other way around. So for instance, we have another shuffler here uh, that, uh, well, again, it has two states, but in this case, uh, it, it does, uh, I put colors here to denote what this shuffler does. 
and it reads two symbols from the three symbols from the first and copies one symbol from or sorry two symbols from the second and then one symbol from the first three symbol four symbols from the second etc so it really um, you don't know how many symbols in principle can be read it is only depends on the state uh, so Uh, in this case, this shuffler alternates uh, possibly empty, empty <coughs> blocks of zeros followed by a one from each sequence. This is what it does. Well, enough for uh, examples. So the theorem says that shuffling two normal independent words yields a normal word. Uh, and in particular, the join is going to be one of the possible operations. Uh, we knew from any possible definition of independence, independence, the join should be one of the operations that should preserve uh, normality, which is, we knew that had to be true. Uh, but this is more, which, which is the operation is called shuffling. Um, however, you, it is possible to obtain a normal word without coming from independent uh, words and shuffling, so there are some other ways. It, it, it is, in fact, possible to take dependent words and uh, shuffle them and put, obtain a, a normal word. And here is a construction that we have been able to obtain uh, in, in this uh, spirit. And it says that there is a, a word of zeros and ones such that the position uh, uh, the symbol at position n equals the symbol at position 2n. So that means uh, that uh, you have a1 being equal to a2 and e being equal to a4 and being equal to a8, and then a3 being equal to a6 and being equal to a12, uh, and so on. Uh, it, it was not clear that such a thing existed, so with this a condition that is a, a recurrent condition or a recursive a condition, uh, it might be that it was impossible. So the construction itself has been uh, very welcome because it has a lot of structure inside. And so far, the, cons the known constructions of normal numbers did not have the spirit of imposing some conditions in the expansion. So it looks a particular combinatorial construction, but it, we learned that there is a lot of room uh, to impose some uh, arithmetic conditions inside the expansion. So this definition um, of a sequence uh, satisfies that the uh, sequence X is equal to the sequence at its even positions. Uh, so as a corollary, we obtain a normal word X such that the odd and the even part are not independent because, in fact, the even part equals to the x itself. So, so, so what you do is just to take what a1, a3, a5, a7, a9, all the arbitrary, somehow you can choose them, and then you decide what is all other. Exactly, and uh, what you just mentioned is uh, illustrated in this uh, uh, <coughs> picture that I'm going to show now, which is kind of a Tuplitz transformation. Tuplitz um, has a method to construct uh, periodic functions, and then it was used by uh, Jabok, Jacob, Jacobs and Kenny to construct 0-1 sequences that are periodic. And using that kind of construction, one can think of uh, uh, this uh, particular construction I'm telling today as a kind of Toeplitz construction. So you start with X uh, being a1, a2, and so on, and what you do is you put at the, the, uh, the se your sequence, you put it uh, in the odd positions, uh, and you leave the even positions empty. And you say that uh, you are going to construct a new sequence that you call it T of X, it is a triplet transformation of X, being a sequence of B1, B2, etc., where the BN equals to the AM for this uh, formula uh, for N. It is a power of K, to, well, 2 to the K times an 
odd number. And if you take k equals zero, uh, you, you obtain all these numbers, as I said, in the odd positions. And if you take k equals one, uh, you complete uh, the positions that are in blue. If you take k equals two, you complete the positions that now appear in uh, pink. Uh, k equals three, uh, well, the ones that follow. Uh, and so on, it, it happens that uh, in the limit, you complete all the positions and that can be proved that the method actually converges until you complete all the positions. So this gives us a general uh, way of constructing sequences by giving different definitions for the uh, symbols BN. Uh, in part, this is one particular way uh, for defining N. And a lot of freedom appears. So where, which are the, the questions are, which are the sequence you can start with so that you do the tuplet transformation and you still keep normality. Uh, and uh, what other sort of transformations uh, you can use. So all this freedom. And the first uh, thing we uh, found is that not only you can do it with even positions being equal to uh, the whole sequence, uh, but you can actually use any positive integer p and say that the symbol at position n equals the symbol at position pn. So not only n equals to n, uh, but any p. And in fact, uh, you get uh, a normal word with this property as well. And we conjecture, we don't know, but we conjecture that uh, for taking the tuplet style transformation being the one I mentioned in my previous slides, then uh, Champernon, if you start with Champernon sequence, uh, you apply this transformation, then you get a normal sequence. The experiments say that yes, but we don't know how to prove it. But maybe just you can start for every normal sequence. For normal. That's right. Uh, uh, the conjecture says that uh, for the set of uh, sequences uh, for which you can start with, and if you do the triplet transformation, you get it normal. Uh, for actually, for every every normal sequence, it happens to be false because we already have a counter example. But this might be true, which is similar to what you, I think. Just suggested. And this is not how you prove the, the theorem. No. No, no, no. This is something else. Our theorem is a particular construction. And now we come to the other uh, operation that I mentioned that was called selection. And this theorem that I'm going to mention now looks very nice, but in fact, it was easy to prove. So we are very happy about the two results I just showed. And this is also nice, but easy. Um, but uh, a selector is, again, like a splitter uh, that we said from an input. We were dividing the input into two possible outputs. That was our definition of a splitter. Now you can think of a selector as a kind of splitter that selects uh, on the first tape and the second tape of the slip splitter, you ignore it. So what you do is you just keep some of the digits of your input sequence and ignore all the digits uh, that you would have put in the second tape. Is this clear? <coughs> yeah. Uh, and this uh, notion of selecting uh, is similar to uh, the definition of selection that can be made uh, from thinking of a set of words, L, and given an input sequence x, a, given by the symbols a1, a2, etc., we say that we will go into select from x uh, the positions for which, and we will write x segment L, uh, some positions of x that correspond to the next position after finding that an initial segment of x is a word that belongs to L. So L acts as uh, an indicator that if there is a word in x that coincides with an initial segment of x, then we select from x the next position after uh, that initial uh, 
uh, segment size. Uh, so, well, that this is a definition that is similar to thinking of a selector operationally, as I mentioned. Uh, and it would look like this, uh, a selector that we have an input from one tape and in an output tape where we actually keep, ignore the uh, red digit or keep the red digit. Uh, well, that, this is just a drawing with particular example, doesn't mind the example itself. Uh, and it was known from 1968 that if you start with a normal sequence and you do the selection with a finite automaton, uh, then what you obtain is again uh, a selection, uh, a selected sequence which is normal. So selection by finite automata preserves normality. It is uh, interesting that there are selections based uh, on uh, non-finite automata, but uh, automata recognized by one turn push down uh, or deterministic one counter uh, machines uh, that will not preserve normality. And this was done by Merkel and Riemann in 2003. But if you stay with finite automata, great, uh, you preserve normality. And our theorem says that if you add to your selection an oracle tape uh, and you fill in that oracle tape with an independent word of the, what you put in your input tape, then again, you're going to preserve normality of the input tape. And this is what I say that it is a very nice result, but the proof mimics the proof of what happens without the oracle. Uh, so we arrive to the open problems. Uh, again, we are at the moment where we say we want an example of two independent words. Uh, again, we are at zero. We don't know how to do, and I, I look forward to see two normal words being independent. But what kind of, I will say example, what kind of, 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 of concreteness you want? So if if possible, Champerno and Champerno prime. take two random, two random numbers, no, for example. It, that is true. Uh, yes, uh, I agree. We would like very concrete style in the way uh, that has other mathematical properties except being uh, normal. And if you, if you just construct compute to, to computable independent normal word like you did with, with normal tuning, yes, normal uh, machines, uh, also not, not an example. It, yes, it is less satisfying, more. but still good. <laughs> still good. No, no, no. You can, uh, uh, if you're not careful, you may end up with uh, two things that are the problem is that on the oracle tape, you can read more things. You, you, there is no bound on how much oracle tape you read. Oh, so it's not, not, not yes. I see, and then when the, uh, when the, the art part can help, uh, help compressing the art part. Uh, yes. So uh, another problem is a constructive uh, sequence of zeros and ones for which you have two. Uh, of these uh, arithmetic conditions, say position, uh, even positions coincide with it. Uh, well, the, the position to n is equal to position uh, n. Here it should say a and a. There is a mistake here. <laughs> and say uh, you do it for another, uh, also another condition, position 3n equals to position n. And we guess it would be true that there exists such a uh, thing that we normal with that condition, but we have not been able to um, do it yet. Uh, another problem, and this is uh, deep, uh, develop the theory of independence in terms of uniform distribution module one, and it is known that it is, uh, you can define normality, this is another way to define normality as in, in a given base B, as asking that the sequence of real numbers that come multiplying your real number x by powers of uh, the base uh, 
gives you a uniform uh, uh, a sequence that is uniformly distributed modulo one. So in the real, so you take the expansions of this multiplication, and you want to see that these expansions are equally distributed in the unit interval. And this is an old theorem by Wall. Uh, so it is possible to understand normality as this property of uniform distribution. We come to the so end. So look more like, like the, just the formulation of the definition. It's not, not something. Yeah, that is a. Re this is an old result by Wall. Yes, a reformulation of the definition. But what I say is, define independence in terms of uniform distribution. That is not clear because you don't know how much you have to consider from it. So you have to, mm -hmm. to use some kind of functions called shufflers and mm -hmm. or somehow you have to define this incompressibility uh, and conditional uh, compression ratio in terms of uniform distribution. It is not yet clear to me how to define it, but it should be possible, I guess. Uh, and then we have already talked yesterday about uh, shift spaces. Well, the whole theory of uh, compression can be a thought in a finite subshift or shift in general, but in particular for shift of finite type, one can develop a Hoffman coding for that shift and consider incompressibility by finite automata, not in the full shift as we have seen today, but in a uh, subshift. Uh, in particular, uh, we, Alvarez, Nicolas Alvarez, a student uh, working with me, and Olivier Carton uh, already uh, have the theorem that says a sequence in a subshift is normal if and only if it is incompressible by the finite tr transducer. So by adapting the notion of compression now uh, for finite subshift. However, we have not uh, yet uh, considered the notion of independence in subshifts, which requires more work because you have to consider also the oracle uh, and compressibility with oracle. All right, uh, we come to the end, and just with a concluding re remark, uh, which is to tell you about the motivation uh, for me to study these things, uh, with with, that is that is very little known about the interplay between Diophantine appro uh, approximations of Diophantine properties of real numbers, uh, computational properties, and combinatorial properties. It is not known how these things are related. Some what we know is maybe ap approach a number with only one of these, uh, but we don't know how to combine them. So the investigations of normal numbers, uh, for me, are a way to make progress in understanding this connection. And this is the end. <laughs>